Dr. Cohn, welcome everyone. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Vanna Zachariou. So Vanna is a full professor in the departments of neuroscience and pharmacological sciences here at Mount Sinai and really a, a wonderful colleague. Vanna is very well known for her work on, on pain, central mechanisms of uh, pain, and in particular, the, the reward impacts of pain, the hedonic mechanisms of pain, and the implication of brain reward circuits in regulating responses to pain. Uh, Vanna is also an expert in G-protein signaling, and again, also very well known for her work on the regulator of G-protein signaling class of proteins, the RGS proteins. So I am delighted that Vanna accepted the invitation to present today. Um, I'm looking forward to her slides and her presentation. And uh, without further ado, Vanna, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. For, thank you for the invitation and the nice introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, I'm going to share with you some of our recent uh, uh, data from projects on chronic pain mechanisms. Um, and uh, as you may know, we are focusing on intracellular adaptations to chronic pain and chronic pain medications with two main research directions. One is to monitor signal reduction, signal reduction complexes that modulate GPCR signaling in specific uh, brain regions with focus on uh, RGS uh, G protein complexes. And, uh, also on transcriptional and epigenetic adaptations that are associated with prolonged pain states. Um, we have three main goals. One is to optimize the actions of opioid analgesics. I'm not gonna talk so much about opioids today, but I will discuss projects on intracellular mechanisms that underlie the actions of antidepressant drugs in models of neuropathic pain. I will also discuss new projects on targets that uh, uh, we can use for the treatment of chronic pain and their molecules that we can target to disrupt actually chronic pain processes instead of just suppressing pain signs. I can't even start showing you data before acknowledging all these uh, amazing scientists that worked in my lab over the last year, year and a half through very crazy circumstances and two pandemics. Uh, but uh, all I can say is that COVID cannot suppress talent and creativity. Also, it seems like uh, the, you know, living and working in New York under a pandemic wasn't challenging enough for some of us. So uh, Alex Serafini and Carrie Price teamed up with uh, Justin Freire uh, from Bent Nervers Lab and moved to a BL3 facility to actually hold uh, SARS-CoV-2 vials and infected animals uh, to understand how uh, COVID promotes uh, neuropathy. Uh, and soon after that, also Andres and Jeff Simmering joined uh, because, as they say, uh, they wanted to get to war and fight COVID instead of sitting around Zoom meetings like I did. Uh, so uh, after, you know, that's the reason. This is the team that worked on, on COVID. Uh, and, and for this reason, we call them the Dorsal Gangia Rebels. The DRG Rebels have actually produced many data this year, uh, but not only on this project, but many other projects that I'm going to share with you today. Pain affects millions of people, and I think it's going to be very hard to think of a cell type or a brain region that doesn't affect pain. Uh, of course, as you know, pain is comorbid with many debilitating disorders. And of course, there's high degree of comorbidity between chronic pain and depression, as well as comorbidity between substance use disorders and chronic pain. But I wanted to remind you that, you, you know, while, while you see this presentation, don't think of chronic pain as prolonged acute pain. We have very specific symptomatology, uh, actually various symptoms that you know, may uh, be expressed uh, differentially between chronic pain patients. And that's what's making the managing, managing of chronic pain quite challenging. Some of these symptoms include allodynia and hyperalgesia. And these are signs that we can also observe in animal models, along with dysesthesias, paresthesias, 
Um, but uh, a range of other symptoms, some of these um, uh, mentioning here, insomnia, mood disorders, catastrophizing, cognitive and memory deficits, fatigue, numbness, stiffness. This is just gives you an idea of how hard it is to manage chronic pain. And of course, you need to know the pathways that underlie chronic pain. Uh, of course, the best characterized pathway involves the dorsal ganglia, spinal cord uh, pathway, which is very important for the induction, the transmission, and the modulation of central sensitization. Central sensitization is the process that actually helps transition from acute to chronic pain states and maintain chronic pain states, and that involves aberrant glutamatergic transmission in many levels of the nociceptive pathway, among other things. The thalamus is uh, another critical area for pain processing. Uh, it receives information from peripheral sites and also re uh, relays information to many brain areas, including subcortical and cortical areas. Another pathway that I want to mention for its importance on chronic pain is a descending inhibitory pathway originating from midbrain, from the periglata gray, uh, all the way down to the superficial dorsal horn. This pathway is suppressing um, spinal cord uh, activity, superficial dorsal horn activity, and this happens successfully with acute or subacute pain, but this we see this regulation of this pathway with chronic pain conditions. And of course, there's a role of the reward pathway in the perception and the modulation of sensory and affective components of chronic pain. In terms of chronic pain medications, um, there's quite a few drugs that have been used over the years. Antidepressants have used for over 40 years. They would have been fantastic if they didn't have such a slow onset of action and so many side effects that they are not tolerated, especially in older uh, populations. The same case applies for anticonvulsants and gabapentinoids, which um, work on a subset of neuropathic pain patients, but they are not very well tolerated. I'm not even gonna mention the problems with using opioids chronically for the treatment of pain, but an interesting fact is that they are not even efficacious uh, compared to these other categories in alleviating uh, sensory hypersensitivity signs. So they work better for acute pain conditions. And there are novel interventions like nerve blocking, meditation, PRP, that uh, show that there are, there, there are many other ways that we can efficiently uh, and more selectively target pain mechanisms. But what's important for drug development is to have a very good understanding of the intracellular adaptations that occur at all these different levels of the nociceptive pathways. There is now a wealth of studies documenting the importance of the nucleus accumbens in the transition from acute to chronic pain, and in, in uh, several, we see activation of this uh, pathway on, on nucleus accumbens uh, neurons in uh, patients suffering from different types of chronic pain. There's also evidence for preclinical studies uh, highlighting mechanisms that affect motivational, affective, and sensory states in models of chronic neuropathic pain um, in the nucleus accumbens. So one of the initial projects that uh, we started when I moved to Sinai with Janina Descalzi, that, uh, that was a postdoc that at the time worked in my lab, and she has her own laboratory now, um, uh, was to understand what are the gene expression adaptations that prolong pain uh, states uh, uh, trigger. And so we used a standard model of peripheral nerve injury that at the time used uh, the field used to study chronic pain, uh, you know, for a time frame of one or two weeks. So what Janina did was to use the spare nerve injury model, but monitor sensory and affective deficits for several weeks. And as you can see, spare nerve injury causes persistent mechanical allodynia. Actually, mice never uh, recover from this sensory deficit. And at the beginning, we don't see any anxiety or depression. But a month later, Janina observed anxiety-like behaviors, as well as deficits in sucrose preference and forcing mobility time that reflect depressive states. So next, Janina harvested tissue from this late uh, neuropathic pain time point 
from the prefrontal cortex, the nucleus accumbens, and the pericardial gray in order to understand gene expression adaptations in each of these brain regions uh, in response to neuropathic pain states by use of RNA sequence. And you can see uh, in this graph that uh, chronic pain states promote robust gene expression adaptations in each of these brain regions, but not a single uh, gene that will commonly regulate it in all, actually one, the, in all three sites. However, with upstream pathway analysis, Janina identified several canonical signaling pathways that were regulated in two or all three of these brain regions, including uh, cyclic AMP and G-proteic signaling pathways, as well as glucocorticoid, uh, glutamatergic, uh, cytokine, and uh, um, nitric oxide signaling pathways. And when uh, she used meta-analysis to compare her data sets to publish work on depression, anxiety, and pain, she discovered that several GPCRs and transcription factors are affected by all these conditions, but a very large number of genes were uniquely regulated by chronic pain. And that's very important because we really want to understand their functional significance. Janina also used a threshold-free RHO analysis to monitor genes that were co-upregulated or downregulated between these different brain regions. For example, we have many genes that are upregulated in the nucleus accumbens and in the pericardial gray, and they fall in these um, categories. And if we focus on negative regulation of biosynthetic processes and look at this protein-protein interaction network, we see three histone deacetylases popping up. Uh, and actually, Janina confirmed HDAC5 upregulation uh, with QPCR in the accumbens and in the PAG. I'm going to continue a bit on the mechanism of HDAC5 action in the nucleus accumbens and remind you that uh, we know uh, quite a bit about HDAC5 primarily in addiction and depression models. And this is a cartoon from Chris Cowan showing the delicate mechanisms that control the shuttling of HDAC5 to the nucleus after increased activity, for example, increased uh, cyclic AMP activity. Um, in the nucleus, HDAC5 is suppressing the expression of several target genes. So in the lab, we use the neuropathic pain model and antidepressants that have uh, good antiallergenic properties to understand how G-protein modulators and HDAC5 uh, modulate responses to antidepressants. So first of all, there was absolutely no effect of HDAC5 on sensory hypersensitivity behaviors associated with prolonged uh, nerve injury. But when we gave a very low dose of the antidepressant dizipramine, that's among the most efficacious antiallergenic agents, dizipramine doesn't do anything at these doses in wild type animals, but it's, um, it, it promotes recovery from mechanical allodynia in mice lacking HDAC5. And even if we use higher doses where the wild type animals respond, we still see a better respond, response in the knockout mice. Uh, Part of this phenotype had to do with HDAC5 actions in nucleus accumbens, because if we overexpress HDAC5 in this brain region by uses of HSV vectors, we see blockades of the antiolidinic actions of standard um, dizipramine doses. Vicky Mitzi proceeded to understand the mechanism of HDAC5 action, and uh, with uh, immunoprecipitation assays, she showed that uh, upon dizipramine treatment, HDAC5 forms complexes with G-protein beta subunits, and using uh, nuclear site plasmic fra fractionation assays, she observed increased presence of HDAC5 in the nucleus after acute treatment with the zipramine. We see the same with G-beta subunits, but not uh, later on uh, with chronic zipramine at time points that we see a therapeutic response. So I'm going to use this cartoon to summarize Vicky's findings. With acute zipramine, we see a delay of uh, drug response because HDAC5 shuttles to the nucleus and suppresses the expression of genes that are important for recovery from um, neuropathic pain states. Uh, but with chronic dizipramine or knockout of HDAC5, now we have a much faster response and reversal of this maladaptive plasticity that neuropathic pain states induce in the brain reward pathway. 
So a hypothesis is, well, if HDAC5 suppresses the expression of genes that are necessary for synaptic remodeling and recovery from chronic pain states, we can first of all understand what, which are these target genes that are being suppressed, either by chip sequencing or by start testing some of the known targets of HDAC5, and then make the intervention to promote their activity, because that might give us an antidepressant-like effect. Pharmacologically, that's not so easy because we cannot use non-selective HDAC inhibitors. That would be a, a drug with numerous side effects. But as more selective compounds come available, that uh, becomes a, a, a more realistic possibility. Also, as I said before, we can target transcription factors that are suppressed by HDAC5 or make interventions in methylation complexes. And this will give us maybe an antidepressant-like uh, effect, uh, but also it, it may happen much faster. Um, so one of the known targets of HDAC5 is the transcription factor MEF2C. Uh, MEF2C has a very well, uh, well documented um, mechanism of action in uh, models of substance abuse, and it is expressed in both D1 and D2 enriched populations of the uh, nucleus accumbens in a similar pattern to HDAC5. What we know from human studies is that MEF2C haploid sufficiency results in very severe pain deficits in humans. So Alex Serafini, in collaboration with Sharam Iberian, um, uh, moved on and used a long-term peripheral nerve injury model to understand if uh, neuropathic pain states affect the uh, methylation of MEF2C promoter in the accumbens, and indeed, we see a decrease in uh, MEF2C, MEF2C uh, promoter methylation. And Alex also identified a different uh, transcription factor predicted uh, to bind to specific GC sites. And several of these uh, molecules have a known action in mood disorders or in painful neuropathy. Alex also proceeded to understand the functional role of MEF2C or, uh, overexpression in the trajectory of sensory hypersensitivity in models of neuropathic pain. So um, uh, in collaboration with SRAM, we use MEF2C expressing vectors, infected the nucleus accumbens of adult mice, and several weeks later, Alex induced uh, spare nerve injury to promote neuropathic pain states and use the bunch of behavioral assays to assess neuropathic pain-related uh, behaviors. So as you can see here, uh, when Alex uh, tested mechanical hypersensitivity in the von Frey assay, he didn't see any deficits due to MEF2C overexpression at baseline responses or after nerve injury. Uh, we saw the expected mechanical hypersensitivity for at least two weeks. But after that, Alex observed uh, recovery from uh, mechanical hypersensitivity in MEF2C overexpressors. We also saw a reduction in dynamic allodynia, but no effect on um, no effect on um, uh, noxious stimuli like pinprick assay. Also, the MEF2C overexpressions do not show guarding behavior. That this is one of the uh, signs that we typically see. Uh, with uh, nerve injury. Uh, and of course, um, if there's no, not so much sensory hypersensitivity, there's no anxiety. So um, attenuated barbell marrying behavior in response to SNI in MEF2C overexpressors. Alex has um, many data on this project, but because his work in progress meeting is next week, I'm going to let you attend his meeting. Uh, but I want to mention that there was a lot of criticism uh, before uh, in the field about using uh, C57 mice. So all the experiments I just described involved uh, DBA background, but we were curious and we also use C57 background. And you can see that MEF2C overexpression works very well. And we see uh, actually an even better better antihelodynic response in adult C57 mice. Alex continues with uh, many different experiments, as I mentioned, but uh, another approach that he has also taken is to understand the cell type specific gene expression adaptations uh, at three months after nerve injury in nucleus accumbens. And uh, for these uh, studies, he used single nuclear RNA sequencing in collaborations with Panos Russo's team and many others. And um, I'm going to continue. 
uh, on a status in a different HDAC, uh, HDAC1, uh, has a very prominent role in the uh, reward pathway. Um, but Kerry Price uh, developed a project uh, to understand um, the uh, impact of chronic pain on opioid physical dependence. So uh, what Kerry did was he developed um, a model of oxycodone misuse. And uh, he generated mice that suffer from neuropathic pain using the SNA model for several weeks, but he also used pain-free mice. And he treated them for two weeks with very high doses of oxycodone, like much higher than the doses are necessary to actually uh, provide an analgesic response. And um, uh, this is uh, expected to uh, cause uh, physical dependence, and we see spontaneous withdrawal uh, for several uh, weeks after the cessation of oxycodone treatment, uh, and we see deficits in uh, various affective behaviors, as well as in uh, several sensory deficits. So we also observe thermal hyperalgesia in between oxycodone doses. So oxycodone acutely will alleviate pain, but the day after we will see hyperalgesia. Um, so the reason actually uh, Kerry started this project was to monitor gene expression adaptations in several uh, brain regions that uh, are involved in addiction and chronic pain, like the medial prefrontal cortex, the nucleus accumbens, and the ventral tegmental area. And I'm not going to stay so much on information from the bioinformatic analysis. This is a very big and interesting story. But just to give you an idea, for example, in the nucleus accumbens, we see uh, very robust gene expression adaptations with uh, an, a peripheral nerve injury. And some of these genes are also regulated by opioid withdrawal in pain-free states. But the patterns are different with the genes being contra-regulated in chronic pain mice that are dependent to oxycodone. And we see completely contra-regulated genes between conditions in the VTA. Uh, but when Kerry uh, ranked different canonical pathways uh, in, in his APA analysis to look at, um, um, at gain information about regulation in uh, different brain regions of interest with all these treatments, um, and uh, if you take a look at top upstream regulator, we uh, identified HDAC1 as one of the targets that we wanted to validate. Uh, in models of uh, oxycodone misuse and see if we can inhibit HDAC1 to prevent oxycodone withdrawal. That was possible uh, because uh, I had an RCY compound in my drawer thinking that we were going to, to use it uh, for pain studies. And that was in a collaboration with Genesee and Matt Jarpy. Uh, we know, uh, so this is a, um, a mixed uh, HDAC1, H2 inhibitor that's brain penetrant. We know a lot about the involvement of HDAC1 in addiction processes, but HDAC1 um, inhibition can actually, at least par partially, alleviate neuropathic pain states. So when Kerry used the same paradigm, um, he used for his RNA sequencing analysis, but also in included a group of RCY compound treated mice. He in observed in our control groups uh, the expected thermal hypersensitivity in response to oxycodone, uh, also uh, thermal hypersensitivity in pain-free and chronic pain mice in response to oxycodone withdrawal. But uh, none of these deficits were uh, shown in mice pretreated with the RCY compound. And good news, the compound also works very well in female mice. Kerry also tested the compound in a number of affective uh, withdrawal signs. I'm not going to show all that, but share with you only data for the four-swim assay, where we see that the compound is particularly efficacious in treating um, uh, uh, depression-like behaviors in oxycodone uh, groups that are under chronic pain. The next HDAC uh, we uh, investigated was HDAC6. And that's very different from the molecules I described before, not only structurally, because it contains two enzymatic domains, but also because it's barely found in the nucleus. It's a cytoplasmic deacetylate, which uh, affects several substrates like subtubulin 1333. Um, 
and it, uh, its role in, uh, uh, in axon loss and uh, uh, pain is well documented because several inhibitors have very um, strong effects in inhibiting um, axon loss or alleviating signs of uh, neuropathic pain in models of chemotherapy-induced neuropathy. In collaboration with Genesee, we use two selective HDAC inhibitors in models of neuropathic pain to see if we can see alleviation of uh, sensory hypersensitivity behaviors. Compound 738 crosses the blood brain barrier. Com compound uh, 257 does not. It's a peripherally acting compound. And for Anna so that within a few days of treatment with compound 738, we see robust alleviation of mechanical allodynia. This effect doesn't stay around uh, if we stop administering the drug. But if we keep giving compound uh, 738 on a daily basis, we don't really see tolerance that we would see with opioids. So we can give these compounds long term. Another piece of information is that even if we use mice that uh, suffer from neuropathic pain for three months and we start treatment, we still see a potent antihistamine effect. And this is good news because this is closer to the human conditions where someone suffers for several months be before they seek treatment. But we're surprised the peripherally acting compound uh, was quite potent in alleviating mechanical hypersensitivity in models of peripheral neuropathy as well as in models of peripheral inflammation, and it works very well in male and in female mice. So that was quite intriguing, but also uh, uh, therapeutically, I think it's a nice piece of information because uh, also not reaching the brain may suggest fewer type side effects. So we have a promising new neuropathic pain medications, um, these drugs also work for uh, peripheral inflammation, but not for acute pain, and we don't see tolerance. And of course, uh, uh, ongoing and future studies want to focus on HDAC6. Uh, we have an HDAC6 uh, Newton uh, line, a FLOX line, and we want to first uh, start to understand the functional role of HDAC6 in um, chronic pain conditions, and also gain insight from RNA sequencing on gene expression adaptations that these inhibitors promote in the dorsal ganglia. Just going to show you a few data with uh, the Newton mice. Faranasacloth initially knocked out HDAC6 in uh, serotonin neurons or in neurons of the dorsal refer because this is where HDAC6 is enriched in the brain. But we saw absolutely no effect in the trajectory of sensory hypersensitivity um, with these interventions. On the other hand, Jeff Zimmering more recently with Kerry Price knocked out uh, HDAC6 in the dorsal ganglia by use of the HDAC6 flux line and a V creep vector injection in the sciatic nerve. And they saw that complete prevention of mechanical hypersensitivity in a model of chemotherapy induced neuropathy. So, to summarize for this part, um, several HDACs can be targeted for, for very unique effects in pain treatment. HDAC5 inhibition will help accelerating the onset of action of antidepressants and enhance their anti efficacy. Uh, HDAC12 inhibitors are very important as they might be a solution to transition from opioid to non opioid treatment for chronic pain patients with, without going through withdrawal. And we can continue using them as they suppress sensory hypersensitivity. And for HDAC6, uh, what can I say? Who needs opioids if you have a peripherally acting inhibitors that can successfully alleviate uh, neuropathic and inflammatory pain signs? I'm going to switch now to projects on novel targets of chronic pain and uh, projects that uh, involve G-protein signaling modulators. So our rationale here is that we're not going to target a specific receptor or ion channels. We're going to target signal transduction pathways that control GPCR activity and downstream uh, signaling events, uh, but they have more regional effects. Uh, and they may have more than one uh, GPCR uh, targets. So this is, might be a way to disrupt central sensitization. And I'm gonna talk about projects on female specific mechanisms of pain and on a project where we are, can actually disrupt the maintenance of chronic pain. And it's the time of the lecture when I'm gonna uh, 
explain again how RGS proteins work because these are the molecules we will be targeting. So these are uh, ubiquitous regulators of G protein signaling. Uh, so when a GPCR is activated, we see dissociation from beta gamma and alpha subunits and activation of their respective effectors. But an RGS will bind to G-alpha and act as a GTPase to promote signal termination. That was what they were identified for. But in many cases, RGSs are not GTPases, but they still bind to G-alpha. That will have a completely different effect because now we have prevention of effector activation for G-alpha without affecting beta-gamma signaling. And that's important because beta-gamma subunits control many of the channels that we know that uh, contribute to pain sensitivity and chronicity. Uh, well, having said that, we now know a lot more about RGS proteins, and um, I have to say they are not only localized in the membrane, they can be found in many other cellular compartments, including the nucleus. And this is a table from a recent review by Farana, where she's listing uh, the different uh, functions uh, identified for RGS proteins, and you can see that they can directly bind to GPCRs, uh, they can modulate several uh, channel function. They can act as scaffolds. Um, they can affect microtubule stability, a robust effect on transcriptional events. Uh, they even can control chromatin function. But this might be a good thing because we have multifunctional proteins, as I said before, that they might, they might modulate uh, many GPCRs that contribute to chronic pain and many of these ion channels that are targeted by uh, chronic pain drugs, but targeting one of these components is not enough. Uh, so maybe we can find an RGS that is expressed in the nociceptive pathway and can be targeted. That could be possible because there are over 40 RGSs, they're structurally diverse. They also show a high degree of uh, diversity in their tissue distribution. And they show some preference for receptors and G-alpha subunits, at least under physiological conditions. They modulate many of the receptors that we know that they play a role in analgesia or pain processing from monoamine, opioid, mercotropic glutamate, adenosine, histamine, just to name a few. And also um, another interesting piece of information is that there are very precise mechanisms that control the stability and degradation of each RGS, which be a nice way that someone can target these molecules. So I'll share with you a project uh, on the role of RGZ1, which is a small RGS that controls GLFA, GLFA Z signaling with a sex specific role in chronic pain. Uh, this protein affects the, the function of the descending inhibitory pathway. I'm reminding you this is a pathway that contributes to chronic pain because it's dysregulated uh, under prolonged pain states. And so we have higher uh, spinal cord activity uh, uh, when the pathway is suppressed. Um, it's interesting that rgs 2 nd is probably also named RGC1, um, is uh, probably the only RGS that we know that is expressed only in the brain, in rodents and in humans. And we recently found a very important uh, function of RGS4 in modulate, uh, sorry, RGZ, uh, in modulation of uh, uh, new opioid receptor signaling in the periacadactyl gray, uh, because RGS1 competes with axin which is also an RGS, for binding to G-alpha subunits. And this competition affects transcriptional events um, and the beta-catenin pathway because axin is a key component of the beta-catenin pathway. Farana also identified RGZ pathways originating from the PAG to the VTA that positively modulate the rewarding actions of morphine. But I'm not gonna talk about these projects because I'm gonna focus on a finding regarding uh, sex-specific regulation of RGC1 or RGS20 by chronic pain in the periacadactyl gray only. Um, and that's important because as my friend Jeff Mogil uh, mentions in this review, most of the uh, preclinical work uh, has been performed in male models. Um, we now, things look better, but even now, if you look at the reported phenotypes, it's usually something that we observe in male mice that doesn't happen in females. So identifying uh, female-specific mechanisms is, is, is critical. And 
uh, Sevi Gaspari in the lab used our arduous 20 knockout line and a model of peripheral inflammation, the complete Fred, uh, Fred adjuvant uh, injection to the uh, hindpo, to understand the impact of arduous 20 inactivation in the trajectory of sensory hypersensitivity. So with this model in wild type animals, we see mechanical allodynia, but over a few uh, weeks, mice recover. We see a more severe allodynia in a delayed recovery uh, upon uh, knockout of Arduous 20. We also see um, more severe Hargreaves responses and a more prolonged uh, uh, thermal hypersensitivity in the Hargreaves assay. And none of these uh, effects are observed in male uh, mice. SEVI also utilized their flux line to downregulate RGZ20 in the perigdata gray, and again, assess the impact of this intervention in CFA-related behaviors. And again, we see a similar period phenotype that we observed with constitutive knockout animals. So it's RGZ20 actions in these brain regions that um, may affect the severity of sensory hypersensitivity. And we see that in also in models in, of peripheral neuropathy. In these models, mice never really recover, uh, but we can still see more severe mechanical allodynia in female and not in male mice. Anne Ruiz took over this project and used chip qPCR. Uh, to detect changes in the binding of ER elements in the ARGES20 promoter. And under baseline conditions, we see binding of ESR1 and ESR2, but this effect is abolished on, uh, upon prolonged peripheral inflammation. We see also compensatory upregulation of ESR1 and ESR2 in the peric that agree of female, but not male mice. And also used RNA scope. Uh, to show that RGS20 in the perigdata gray is expressed in both uh, glutamate and GABA positive cells, and it's often co-expressed co with G alpha Z. When we use RNA sequencing analysis, uh, we see that um, in the, as you see in the last uh, line of the heat map, uh, prolonged peripheral inflammation. Um, causes a robust changes in gene expression in the periodic gray, but many of these genes that we see being regulated by chronic pain are already up or down regulated by knockout of RGS4. So RGS4 uh, knockout affects many genes and pathways that contribute to sensory hypersensitivity. And some of the key changes we observed uh, involve the uh, serotonin receptor signaling, serotonin synthesis and release, Another uh, pathway that was affected specifically in the knockouts by chronic pain involved estrogen-mediated signaling, and several of these findings have been validated by qPCR or Western blot. So our next question was, we have this regulation of the period that the gray upon knockout of RGS20, and we have more severe pain. So that means decreased activity of the descending inhibitory control that should suggest decreased release of serotonin in the RVM. And this is the case as shown by studies by Erin Calipari, uh, where she used voltammetry to show major deficits in stimulated and ready and spontaneous release of uh, serotonin in uh, a naive and um, CFA cohorts of RGZ knockout mice. That would also predict increased activity in the spinal cord that we can even see by simple C4 senior chemistry. And you can see that under um, CFA, knockout mice uh, have a higher number of CFOS positive neurons. Another approach it we took in collaboration with Ben Garcia and Ian Mace's group was to uh, look at methylation marks um, uh, uh, using proteomic uh, approaches uh, in groups of wild type and knockout naive and CFA treated mice. This is a 10 day, 10 day time point and we see uh, changes in H3 K14 acetylation, and um, the, this effect is no uh, longer observed in the knockout uh, cohort. H3 K14 is upregulated uh, in wild types, as we see with Western blows that confirmed this prediction, and uh, but not in the knockout mice. 
And we continued with uh, chip sequencing uh, mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. the H3K14 uh, antibodies. And uh, we see um, uh, extreme differences in DNA enrichment and unvalidated some of these findings to show that the uh, genes of interest are dysregulated only in female mice. And just to briefly summarize, we see aberrant glutamatergic uh, signaling and um, a, a dysregulation of several lysine ac acetyltransferases, including CAT2B and EP300, but only in female mice. So overall, um, this regulation of RGSU1 promotes uh, uh, adaptations in uh, uh, signaling pathways and neurochemical pathways that um, contribute to, uh, to spinal cord excitability and exacerbate um, uh, pain hypersensitivity. We continue with this project and we want to start new projects to better understand the circuit and cell type effects of RGC1, the implication of GLFZ, and we also want to develop tools for the promotion of RGC1 activity um, to uh, alleviate uh, chronic pain in females. So the last project I will uh, share with you involves RGS4. This is a multifunctional protein with a key role in the induction and in the maintenance of chronic pain. Uh, actually, we've been working with RGS4 for several years in the models of addiction and acute pain, and even in uh, models of depression, but we never really noticed any sensory deficits or any acute pain phenotype uh, all these years. But there were studies that actually show that gain of function mutations of RGS4 contribute to fibromyalgia. And more recently, we developed projects to investigate the impact of RGS4 in chronic pain. So this phenotype was actually discovered by Fiona Carr, who originally meant to um, look at affected components of, pa of pain in a model of neuropathic pain in RGS4 knockout mice. So uh, as uh, expected, we didn't see any deficits in baseline um, mechanical sensitivity or in mechanical allodynia uh, when we induce nerve injury uh, for a couple of weeks. But a few weeks later, Fiona observed that mice actually spontaneously recover from mechanical allodynia. And with this model, we never really see a recovery. So that was a very interesting fi uh, finding. Model mice recover from cold allodynia as well. And we can see this phenotype in other um, milder models of uh, of neuropathy, including chemotherapy-induced uh, peripheral nerve injury. Um, Cleopatra Avrampu uh, took uh, over this project to understand the uh, role of RGS4 in uh, the ventral posterior lateral thalamus, because this was one of the regions that we, see, we saw robust upregulation of RGS4 upon nerve injury. And again, we we don't really see any effect of this intervention in the induction of sensory hypersensitivity, but after a couple of weeks, we see a recovery from sensory hypersensitivity. And of course, RGS4 is highly expressed in many other components of the nociceptive pathways, and we want to understand what are the actions. Um, in all these different regions, uh, including the dorsal root ganglia, where it's abundantly expressed. And that wasn't very hard because the DRG rebels couldn't wait to start uh, studies on peripheral um, uh, ganglia and um, started actually with uh, studies uh, on the regulation of RGS4 expression in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord um, with uh, uh, use of the spare nerve injury model. And as you can see here, there is quite abundant uh, expression of RGS4 in the ventral horn, but we also see it in superficial lamina, especially in somatostatin and proteinorphin expressing neurons. And uh, it's upregulated with prolonged peripheral nerve injury states. And interestingly, this upregulation occurs only in proteinorphin populations. So there's a specific effect of RGS4 in inhibitory interneurons in that region. 
When you look at dorsal ganglia and neuronal markers, we see again a um, uh, vast population of RGH4 with nerve injury. This is consistent with findings from qPCR analysis with models of peripheral inflammation and spare nerve injury. And we also see this upregulation with Western, with Western blots at the protein level. Uh, so uh, just to uh, show you one more of these beautiful pictures with RNA scope analysis, 21 days after spare nerve injury or control conditions, you can see RGS4 in white, um, uh, tubulin in blue, uh, Guinea, an RGS4 competitor in red. Um, and you can see that RGS4 is upregulated and it's upregulated primarily in neurons. To understand the significance of this upregulation, uh, we used uh, conditional knockout models and Kerry developed um, this uh, method for original knockdown by injecting Cree viruses to, in the sciatic nerve of phlox mice. A few weeks later, um, they would induce nerve injury and monitor uh, sensory hypersensitivity behaviors. You can see the beautifully the GFP expression several weeks later in the dorsal ganglia confirming transduction and also the downregulation of RGS4 um, in, this, in the dorsal ganglia several weeks after viral treatment. In terms of behavior, this time we don't see deficits in baseline mechanical sensitivity, but we don't see even see induction of sensory hypersensitivity after peripheral nerve injury. And this is a phenotype that we see in both female and male mice. We also see um, the absence of dynamic allodynia upon a downregulation of RGS4 in the DRGs. Um, this intervention does not affect uh, noxious stimulation as mice respond um, in the same way as wild type controls in the heart rate assay. And of course, if there's no pain, there's no anxiety, as shown by the marble bearing assay. We see a similar phenotype with uh, peripherally uh, chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy model. Uh, and again, we see a brief induction of mechanical allodynia, but within a few days, mice recover and their von free thresholds are identical to those of wild type controls. Kerry also wanted to know the uh, subsets of DRG neurons that express RGS4. So he used RNA scope and monitored uh, RGS4 expression in different populations of nociceptors. And as you can see, the majority of our RGS4 expression involves MRGPRD positive cells. This is a specific subset of non peptidergic C fibers that uh, modulate primarily mechanical hypersensitivity and uh, play a key role in chronic pain. And Kerry developed an intervention to knock out RGS4 conditionally in this population. And uh, he used an um, uh, MRGPRD Cree line crossed with fluxed RGS4. And induction of knockout uh, is achievable upon tamoxifen uh, treatment. So knockout in this specific subset of C fibers show, uh, results in a very impressive phenotype when we use the chemotherapy-induced neuropathic pain uh, model. We see some induction of mechanical hypersensitivity, but mice never reach maximal hypersensitivity that we see in control conditions. Um, we also see prevention of cold hypersensitivity, but the mice respond normally in noxious thermal stimuli, uh, such as the hot plate acid. So we continue these studies and Kerry is analyzing single cell nuclei sequencing data sets in collaboration with Panos Russos from DRGs at time points where the RGS4 mice recover and the wild con type controls are still in pain because we think this type of approach will give us a very important information about the downstream pathways in a cell type specific uh, manner. And uh, we also want to overexpress it at RGS4 to show that uh, promotion of RGS4 activity is very important from the transition from acute to chronic pain. We also want to continue with interventions in RGS4 pathways and find ways to safely um, 
disrupt central sensitization and uh, without the use of uh, uh, drugs that are, uh, promote side effects or addiction related behaviors. So to summarize RGS4 uh, inhibition is a very efficacious way to uh, disrupt central sensitization as we are targeting multiple receptors and ion channels in various levels of the nociceptive pathway. And uh, as I mentioned before, we continue and future work will also investigate circuit specific effects peripherally and in the brain and uh, better understand RGS4 regulated pathways and of course develop tools to target uh, some of these pathways uh, as a novel way to treat chronic pain. And with that, I want to uh, thank all the current and uh, past lab members that perform this work. Um, a large number of collaborators uh, on uh, projects that I discussed uh, today, and of several Sinai collaborators that I didn't get to show um, our um, uh, projects today, um, but it has been wonderful to collaborate with all of you. So thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions now. Fantastic, Vanna. Thank you so much. Any questions for Vanna? Maybe I can start with not, not so much a question, but um, an observation and comment. I was um, really, uh, it was striking to see in their RNA seq data when you looked at uh, oxycodone interactions with pain states, the interleukin 13 looked like it was upregulated in the, the VTA. Um, yeah. And the reason I bring that up is we've been collaborating with Bruno Conti, and you know it, it appears that IL-13 plays really a major role in controlling the activity of VTA dopamine neurons, and does so in a manner that likely depends on stress states. So um, likely, with all the stuff that you have gone on, I suspect you haven't had time to take a look at that, but if you ever do decide to take a look at interleukin signaling in the VTA, I'd love to chat with you about it, because it looks Absolutely. like you've probably got nice dopamine effects going on there. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. I think you've got a question in the chat box, Donna. I don't know if you can see that. If not, I can read it out to you. Yes, I think that was a very nice quick question by Rajesh. He's asking uh, if I predict that uh, uh, because of RGZ activation or inactivation, females might ha have a more, more severe depression phenotype as well. And uh, the answer is yes. So the affective components are also uh, modulated in a sex-specific manner. OK, if there are no other questions, uh, let's thank Vanna for a fantastic presentation. Thank you so right. much, Vanna. Thank you all. Bye.